Well, good evening. Good to see everyone here tonight. I want to welcome back those we didn't have a chance to see this morning. We're glad you're with us. We had some screen issues this morning. I was told that those on my on the left hand side, my right, uh, were unable to see part of the screen, or it had gone off the screen onto the wall. So let me know. Uh, signal me. I, it's hard to see when looking here. I got to look up. So hopefully it works tonight. I think we worked out the kinks, so we'll go through it. I mentioned this morning what we're going to be talking about tonight. And over the last three weeks, we've been talking about modern-day idolatry and the insidious nature of it that it is easy to fall into the traps of doing it, even if we don't recognize it right away. And on Sunday nights, we've been talking about ways that we can guard our hearts away from idolatry and serve the one true and living God. We started a couple weeks ago looking at David's charge to his son Solomon and know the God of your father, knowing who God is and what he has done for us. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2, and looked at the three things that saints are called to do. They're called to attention, to pay attention. They're called to not conform to this world, but be transformed. And we talked a little bit about that transformation. I told you tonight, we're going to talk about that in greater detail. What I plan for us tonight is look at be transformed. And the you'll notice the text is not Romans 12, verse 2. What we're going to do is look at the application of what we studied last week and look at how it correlates with Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Over and over through the last three weeks, we've looked at Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 in various different ways. It has come up, and I mentioned to you there's going to be some overlap as we looked at these things, that one of the best ways we can guard our hearts from idolatry is to give heed to that commandment that Jesus said, there is no greater command than to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. If we do that, we won't have time to devote any other thing to something false, to something that is not living. And so what I want us to do now is to turn to Mark chapter 12. And as you're turning there, before we get to verses 29 through 31, I want to cover a little bit of the things that's going on here in Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12 and verses 18 to 23, the Sadducees asked Jesus a question concerning the resurrection. So really what we're going to be looking at takes place back in verse 18. Now, going into the intertestament period, that's the, the period of silence between the last known book of the Old Testament until the Gospels started being written, there were two sects of the Jews that came out of their religious uh, leaders, actually three. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Now, the Essenes we don't read of in the New Testament because in the second century B.C., they went to Qumran. They left Jerusalem because they were tired of the squabbling between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they went and just became their own little compound in Qumran. What was left in Jerusalem were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And going all the way back to their inception of these two camps coming together, one of the things that they could not agree on, that they came head to head on all the time, was about the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Maybe you learned this as a child that they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. But that was the main difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And so there was this point of contention all the time where the leaders of these two sects butted heads. They also did not believe in, in celestial beings. The Pharisees believed in angels and demons. They believed in a resurrection. They believed there was an afterlife. The Sadducees believed in none of that. And so now we have this occasion in verse 18 where the Sadducees and it, we're told there in Mark 12, verse 18, who say there is no resurrection. They came to Jesus and began questioning him. And they give him this scenario. They said, Moses wrote for us, if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. And they go on, so forth and so on, until no one is left. And they said in verse 23, in the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And they're, they're asking Jesus, they're trying to trap him in a resurrection question. Perhaps their, their goal wasn't really to learn about what he had to say about the resurrection, but maybe get him fighting with the Pharisees. Well, we may not know their full intent. Jesus did, and he said in verse 24, Is this not the reason you're mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Rather than tear apart their analogy, 
Jesus hit them at the heart of their problem. He's saying in the very law that they sought, that they claimed to be religious leaders of, tells us that there is a resurrection. God at the burning bush introduced himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he says he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Jesus answered them. And in verse 28, from Jesus' answer to the Sadducees, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing he had answered them well, asked him, speaking of Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? From this text, it doesn't sound like this man's trying to trap Jesus or, or try to test him in any way, shape, or form, but that he was amazed at the answer Jesus gave to the Sadducees, and so now he's going to take the opportunity to ask this great teacher, what would you say the foremost commandment is? In verse 29, Jesus answered, the foremost is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And we can go on and read in verse 32, and it says, The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. The next part is why I say it didn't look like there was any guile in this man's question to Jesus, that he was truly wanting to know what Jesus would say, and again was amazed at his answer, and showed himself to truly be a scribe of the law. It says in verse 34, when Jesus saw he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. This morning, we talked about the fact that Jesus is the one and only name by which we can be saved. There are no others. He is the way. He is the truth and the life. And here, this man recognized that. He said, he is one. There is no one else besides him. Speaking of God the Father, not realizing he's talking to God. He's talking to the one, the very name by which we can be saved. But Jesus recognized that this man was intelligent, and he said, you're not far from the kingdom. What he means is, is that this man was on the right path. If only he would make the application of what he just recited back to Jesus. And in a lot of ways, that was the problem of the Jewish leaders of that day. They could quote it, they knew it, but they didn't practice it. That's why he was able to tell his disciples, do as they say, but not as they do. Here in this passage in Mark 12, 29 to 31, He's telling us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Love our neighbor as ourself, and there's no other commandment greater than these. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Here he correlates our love with action. In this case, our action being our obedience. We can't say we love God, we love Jesus, but we're going to do these things that make us happy because we really believe with our sincerity of hearts that he's happy when we're happy. That's not what Jesus said. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's easier to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, as Paul instructs Titus in Titus 2.12, when we love the Lord with every ounce of our being. It's easier to deny those temptations that would take us out of God's favor, out of his sight, when we truly love him with everything that we are. And so that's why this is the solution to the idolatry of the world. We are to be a people that has transformed because of our love for God. This word transformed, we talked about it last week in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, and we're going to talk about it in just a second, so we'll come back to that. But we're going to talk about three ways that we are to transform our lives, three different areas. And you'll see why I've used it <clears throat> why I've used the image of the caterpillar to the butterfly. The word transformation is the word we get, the word transformation in the Greek is where we get the word metamorphosis that describes the process of the butterfly changing from that caterpillar, that ugly worm, to the beautiful winged butterfly. And so we're going to talk about transformation over the world. In Mark chapter 12, 30 through 31, I want you to keep this passage in mind as we look at the transformation that we need to make in our lives to combat these evil things. We need to be make a transformation over being a child of the world. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2 is telling us that the power of the gospel can transform one that walks in the course or the power of the devil over into a child of God. There's transformation over one who is a child of the world or a child of Satan into becoming a child of God. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. We can go back to Matthew chapter 10 and see where Jesus outlines this for his disciples. He, says, he tells them the dangers of the world that they're going to live in is that if it persecuted him and hated him first, he says, don't be surprised when it does the same to you because it hated me first. It's going to hate you. It's going to persecute you. If you were of the world, it would love its own, but you're not of this world. And so we see that as saints, as Christians, on Wednesday nights we've been studying what it means to be a disciple and all the different metaphors that are used and how those apply to our daily walk with Christ. One of the things we find out as we look at that, there is a higher calling. There is more expected of us once we obey the gospel than before. We can't just live that old way of life. There is a higher calling. We talked this morning that it, in the early days of the church, it was referred to as the way. Because Jesus says he is the way. We are followers of Christ. It's important as disciples then that we emulate the teacher. We transform ourselves out of the world through the power of the gospel in our lives, that transforming of the mind, that renewing of the mind, into children of God. So first, we must be transformed over the world. That word transform here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where we talked about this last week, where Paul makes three calls to saints, that they pay attention, that they sacrifice, and that they're willing to change. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. <clears throat> that word transformed here in Romans 12 and verse 2 is from the Strong's Greek Dictionary 3339. And it's metamorpho-o. Metamorpho-o. It's the word we get metamorphosis from. It literally means to change form. It's described as to transform. And it's literally, it means to change form. And we see this in nature through the caterpillar to the butterfly. It changes its form. But as we, the next time we see one of the pictures of the butterfly, I want to point something out. That there's still a little outline of where it had come from. And we need to be careful that we don't go back to the image of the worm, but we stay the butterfly. We talked about that living sacrifice, that God doesn't want part of us now. He wants all of us now. He doesn't want a half sacrifice. He doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living sacrifice. Jesus gave his all for us, and he expects us to give our all to him. We're to love him with our whole heart our mind, our soul, and our strength. I like to say it's not a trial run, as you've often heard me say. It's not something that we just give it a try and see where it'll lead. No, in Luke 9, verse 62, Jesus said, the one that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of him. It's not something that we can just try out for a time. We make a lifetime commitment to change our lives, to transform our hearts into his image. 1 John 4.10, 1 John 4.19, Hebrews 12, 1-3, all speak to the ways that we are to be transformed. It says, we love because he first loved us in the 1 John 4 passage. We love because he first loved us. Hebrews 12, 1-3, we talked about that this morning. That we fix our eyes on him. Where is he? Seated at the right hand of God. He's gone forward ahead of us, preparing that home for us as we also read this morning. In 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, 1 John 5, 4. It says in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 John 5, 4 says our faith overcomes the world. 
The only way it's going to overcome the world is if we allow that power of the gospel to transform our hearts. That faith that doesn't waver, that doesn't doubt, that does not let off down rabbit holes of temptation. That's the only way we're going to have that faith that stands. Our bodies are to be holy and acceptable to him. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. We are a royal priesthood to him. As Jesus was proven to be holy and acceptable as the perfect sacrifice, Peter makes that case in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He says, as God is holy, we are to be holy. So saints coming out of the world, we are to be transformed. 2 Peter 1, 4, 1 John 4, 4. We're to offer ourselves <clears throat> to God so our whole bodies will be used for God's glory. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Talks about our bodies are not for immorality, but to bring glory to God. We talked about that last time. That we are to be transformed. Romans 6, 3 through 4. Rising from the waters of baptism, we put to death that old self. We walk in newness of life. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, we're either for him or against him. Remember we talked this morning that the words of Jesus sound very exclusive. They are. He says, you're either for me or you're against me or you're with me or against me. We can't have it two ways. We can't have our foot in the world and a foot in the church saying, we're going to be fine. We, we can dwell in both worlds. Jesus says, I want all of you. And I want all of you now. In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 13, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Many people stop right there and say, See, God's going to save everybody. No, that grace of God appeared, bringing instruction. It says in verse 12, Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Saints are a people that are transformed from our old dead life, from being a child of Satan, from being a child of the world, into a new life of service to God and to one another. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, describes our life before Christ as being dead in our sins, being dead in our transgressions. If we continue reading through Ephesians 2, it says we're made alive in Him. 1 Peter 4, 1 to 5, describes the fact that others around us must see the change. It says they're going to notice you don't do the things you used to do, and they're going to malign you or speak evil of you. I saw this cartoon, and I thought of 1 Peter 4, 1 to 5. It looks like a caterpillar speaking to a butterfly saying, You've changed, man. 1 Peter 4, 1 to 5 tells us our friends are going to see that change. They're going to notice we don't do the same things we used to do. We don't have the same priorities we used to have. We won't engage in the same activities we once did. And it says they're going to malign us. It doesn't matter what condemnation comes with the phrase, you've changed. Hopefully they see that change for the better. And whether they do or not, God will see it for the better. We need to make sure that we stay the butterfly and don't revert back to that caterpillar. Not only are we to transform over the world and from becoming a child of Satan into a child of God, we need to transform over our fleshly desires. Again, Mark chapter 12, 30 through 31, telling us that this ought to be the forefront of our heart, that we love God with everything we are, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, so that we will transform over our fleshly desires. In Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Paul, writing through the Spirit, tells us just a few things that are deeds of the flesh. He says these are things that will keep one out of heaven, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. And then, as Dick said this, this afternoon in the men's meeting, not limited to these things. He says, and things like these. So this is not an exhaustive list. He says, and things like these. Like these things, these areas of life that are for self and for pleasure and bring debauchery and, and defilement to our bodies. He says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, we were dead in our sins before Christ, Ephesians 2, but we were made alive together with him. How? Romans 6, 3 through 4 describes the process. We crucify that old self into the waters of baptism. We rise up with Christ out of the waters of baptism, walking in newness of life. And so we combat the fleshly desires with the fruit of the Spirit. 
1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10 is another list of the deeds of the flesh that we could look at. We cannot claim to be a Mark 12, 30 through 31 Christian, a relationship with God, and also be engaged in the works of the flesh as we can read in Galatians 5. Paul says they'll keep you out of heaven. So he tells us the antithesis to these is in found in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, that we are to put on the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who abide in the sincere love of the Lord, John 15, 10, 1 John 4, 16, will develop the fruits of the Spirit. We will make them a part of our lives. Ephesians 5, 3 and Colossians 3, 5, we spent the last three weeks talking about those, talking about our evil desires, our greed, our covetousness, amounting to idolatry. These are things not to even be named among saints. Or these are not walking in a worthy way of the manner in which we were called. We're to be dead to sin. They have absolutely no place for the saints. And so we're to walk no longer according to our fleshly desires. But we're to walk according to the fruits of the Spirit. Saints who love God with their whole being will be transformed over the bonds of fleshly desires and abide in the love of Jesus. And lastly, as we read through Mark chapter 12, 30 through 31, that we are to give God everything, our whole heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We will transform over apathy and unfaithfulness. In Hebrews chapter, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, all the way, it runs all the way through Hebrews 4 and verse 11. And as you're turning there, we're going to think of some other things. Apathy and unfaithfulness have no place in the Christian who has this type of relationship with God. If we are keeping these first two commandments that God, that Jesus himself said, there's no greater commands than these. It is hard to be apathetic if we are sincere. We're told to be sincere in Philippians 1, 9 to 10. We're told to be sincere in 1 Timothy 1, 5. It talks about pure conscience, a pure love. It is hard to be apathetic and unfaithful if we are sincere. And so in order to be sincere and blameless, in order to love from a pure heart, and a good conscience and sincere faith, as 1 Timothy 1.5 says, this comes from a person whose heart is wholly devoted to God. And so in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, he says, there a sincere, We're to have a sincere love of the brethren and to fervently love one another from the heart. We cannot be apathetic. That means not caring. We cannot be apathetic toward one another and fervently love one another. We can't be apathetic and sincerely love one another they can't happen so in hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7 it says therefore just as the holy spirit says <clears throat> today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years therefore i was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways as i swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But instead it says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And this thought carries all the way to Hebrews 4.11. I encourage you to read that on your own. Apathy and unfaithfulness, unbelief, is what plagued the Israelites. It's what plagued them. Is what kept them out of the promised land to begin with. They were there at its borders. The land that God had promised Abraham, his descendants, would take and possess. And they sent in spies. And they came back, twelve, one from each tribe. And ten of them said, oh no, we can't do this. We saw giants so big we are grasshoppers in our own sight. We can't do it. Well, two who had a different spirit than the rest, Caleb and Joshua, they saw the land with its bounty. They brought back clusters of grapes and many other things. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. They said, God has given it to us. Let's go up immediately and take possession of it. It doesn't matter how big they are. God is bigger. But the crowd, the multitude, listened to the ten. And so it says, God said he swore in his wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And as you read through, we find in verse 19 of chapter 3, 
So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And he goes on and says in chapter 4, as he says about this unbelief, he's telling us that for the Christian, we have another rest promise, that eternal rest within heaven with God. We need to make sure that we don't lose it because of our unbelief, because we become apathetic. The Lord wants individuals that serve him now, and so he wants us to be fruitful. The transformation that must take place over apathy and unfruitful or unfaithfulness is to become fruitful, to be doing something. We're to be sincere and fervent in our love and service to God and to one another. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, we're to always be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I want you to think about that phrase, steadfast, immovable, always abounding. When you think of someone that is always abounding, there's a forward motion. There's constant motion there. So you're always abounding. Is it possible to always be abounding in the work of the Lord and to become apathetic? Is it possible to be always abounding in the work of the Lord to become unfaithful? You can't have it both ways. The solution for the apathetic Christian, the solution for the unfaithful Christian, is to go back to work, to be steadfast, to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If we're always abounding in the work of the Lord, if we're moving forward, there's no time to become uncaring and insincere. There's no time to become unfaithful. We will be doing, we will be fruitful. Matthew 10, 32 to 39 and Luke 9, 62. Jesus says, when anything or any other takes precedence in our service to God, then we are not worthy. Here's where he says, the one that puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not worthy of me. We talked about the last three weeks, Colossians 3, 5. Things that we covet, that we are so greedy for, that we will do anything to obtain, amounts to idolatry. So we need to make sure our heart is free from that love of money. Those that abide the sincere love of God will add the characteristics to their lives that ensure they will not fall. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 11. Talks about these characteristics, starting with our knowledge of God's word and how we apply it. And says, if these characteristics are yours and are not failing, then the entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly supplied to you. That means the entrance into heaven will be abundantly opened unto the one that puts on those characteristics. <clears throat> Saints who love God will be transformed and wholly devoted to him and to one another. So when we transform out of a child of the world or a child of Satan to the child of God, when we transform over those fleshly desires and lusts, when we transform over apathy and unfaithfulness, we can truly be the one who loves God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. When we're truly transformed to serve him, there'll be no place for fleshly desires. There'll be no place for for apathy and faithfulness or excuses of any kind. If you go back to that account that we just talked about in Luke chapter 9, verse 62 and Matthew chapter 10, or Mark chapter 10, is where Jesus calls people and they said they made excuses. Well, I, I have business to attend to. I have a family to attend to. I've got to bury the dead. They made excuses to not follow him. How many times in our lives do we do the same thing? We're too busy. We get too busy to study. If we're too busy to study... I like the old phrase that says then we're too busy because our priorities are not there. We need to change our priorities. Part of transforming our hearts to serve God with everything we are is transforming our thought process, our judgments, our priorities. What becomes important to us. Mark 12, 30, 31 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. How will these be evidenced in our life? How will people see these characteristics? As we just talked about, they will be evidenced by our faithfulness, our steadfastness, and our fruitfulness. What do others see in you? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 
For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. We need to be determined for that transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18, I want you to read that with me as we close. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, but we all, with unveiled face, some translations say open face, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That word transformed into the same image is that same word from, Revel from Romans 12, verse 2, metamorpho, the word we get metamorphosis from, that literally means change form. You see what he's saying? He's saying when we look in the mirror, we ought to be beholding the glory of Jesus. We ought to be reflecting his image because it's in his image we're being transformed into. Are we allowing that transformation process to happen in our lives? Are we giving our hearts wholly and completely and devotedly to him? He says there's going to be a time that this mortal body is going to change. It's going to change form. It's going to transform. We will all be changed. But our eternal change... That immortal body for the eternal punishment or immortal body for eternal life depends on our transformation now, here in this life. How we transform now will determine where we're transformed in the afterlife. May we all be determined now to serve our Savior with the same fervor that he exemplified when he died for you and for me. The question is, are you a caterpillar or are you a butterfly? And if you are a butterfly, remember the outline of that shape reminds us of the outline of the original form. And it's so easy to go back into that old form. It's so easy, in fact, that that's why Jesus says that we need to guard our hearts. We need to devote our whole hearts to him so that there's no room for any of that. So tonight, are you a caterpillar or are you a butterfly? That's the question. How have you transformed? Have you changed form? Or are you still trying to hold to a form of godliness, but still engage in worldly activities? If you are not a Christian tonight, you need to be. To repent of your sins, to be baptized, to change from a caterpillar into the butterfly, so to speak, to change forms, exchanging the, the image that we have now, the sinful image, into the image of the glory of Christ. If you are a Christian in error, repent and return to God. Stay a butterfly. Don't go back to that old form. Don't let that old life come back, but stay transformed in the glory of God. Whatever your request might be tonight, if we can assist you in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.